assume you don't mean any bugs. Improvements, like right? yeah. yeah. Unnecessary improvements. Right. Any case, and <clears throat> Don was at used to be at NASA, and Ben was he was CTO of Skilled or CEO? CTO. CTO of Skilled and Skilled was acquired by Penguin Computing. Yeah. And John is now CTO of Penguin Computing, and a lot of people that are familiar with clusters in Linux, especially the Beowulf clusters, um, probably you know, know of John. And of course, we have our local expert, Kurt Kettle here, who talks about roof networks and stuff like that as a sideline. So I also have two books that I'm going to be Raffling off later on, I've got Dojo and PHP, MySQL, and Apache. I th they, did they, I think Dave wanted this one, but I'm not sure. But he's not here to claim it. Or did you want that? I, I want a Dojo. Oh, okay. We generally uh, steal the book, steal some of the books when we have. Uh, those are. Pearson uh, credit salt. Yes? This is Linux. What are you looking for? Python. Those people out there. Okay. So, Don, it's up to you. Um, Cambridge Brewery closes their kitchen at 10, so we have to get there usually by quarter after 9, 9.30. And Dave is going to give them a call. Okay. Uh, Jock Bernstein here is also going to be yeah. speaking about part of our, our system, uh, so I'll have to try to shorten it. But uh, I want this presentation to be interrupted by questions very frequently, and I'll skip around. Otherwise, you'll just get the doll boring monotone speaking. I'll, I'll read from the slide first. So uh, send your best interest to ask questions and so let me skip around the presentation or move to different pieces. I'm going to be talking about cluster computing. Yeah, everything, everything. So you can ask any question you want at all. Uh, and if we don't get to some topics, uh, I was ready to talk about it, and we just didn't have time. So uh, I'll tailor this to whatever people want to hear about. I'll start with the history and then move into overview and architecture. And then we're going to dive down into a few specific subsystems. And you can get as technical as you like with those. And remember, uh, I only accept easy questions. Easy questions are the ones I can answer. So no hard questions. On the plus side, there's a pretty good chance at least to making up an answer to any question you might have. So we'll go way back in the history. Uh, we'll go way, way back in the history. Here at MIT, I did parallel processing mid-80s, and I worked on custom-designed hardware systems, uh, big shared memory multiprocessors, the 64 processor concert multiprocessor here at MIT, and uh, I took away a lot of lessons from that. Most of those lessons were don't, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. They were, uh, <coughs> you know, that might not be the right approach. So a lot of the things we did with the Beowulf project the opposite of what we did in the research project here at MIT. I'll start the story, though, at, at uh, NASA in 1994. I moved over to NASA in 1994, already a Linux developer, to start the Beowulf project. And what was the Beowulf project? The Beowulf project was an effort to teach people how to take commodity off-the-shelf machines, put them together, and solve, initially, the lighter end of supercomputing workload. Today, they are the supercomputers, the large supercomputers of the world. So we thought about it in 1993. We set up the project. I moved over to uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in 1994, started the Beowulf project, and we started teaching people how to build their own commodity clusters. So it wasn't to build a single cluster. It wasn't to build our own hardware. It was to show people how they could build their own scalable, high-performance machine. We wanted to build a machine that scaled in all dimensions. We wanted to build a machine that could scale up a network. One of the early things we did was channel binding, scaling up networks by putting multiple network channels in parallel and solving problems with network limits that way. 
scaling up uh, the number of disks. Well, that's easy. You just add more disks. Uh, people already do that all over the place, and you don't think of that as clustering technology. Uh, main memory. Well, we wanted to figure out how to share memory effectively between machines. By the way, the answer is don't. And processing power. If you want to be able to plug in a new machine, uh, a handful of new machines, and build a cluster that was more power. It's easiest to talk about hardware. But what we were really trying to do here was to show people how to do it, to learn how to do it ourselves, to demonstrate that it could be done. But instead, I'll talk about, oh, here's the machine we built, and here's the next machine we built. The second point to it and say, you know, here's what we were trying to do. But remember, the underlying thing is just like Linux, we weren't trying to build an operating system in our, in our basement and keep it to ourselves. We were trying to show people how to do it, spread it to the world, teach people how to do it. So we'll start with the light stuff. All the pretty pictures, something, uh, this was 1994 era machine. Uh, <coughs> we we uh, stacked motherboards on trays, built a nice single uh, single piece of hardware, at least it looked that way from the outside until you opened the door. <coughs> and we had some success. We showed that this machine was as fast as a million dollar machine sitting next to it. 16 cheap processors built for less than $50,000. And on some applications, we could equal or exceed the performance of a million dollar early convex machine sitting right beside it. So what do you do when you can build a machine like that? Well, you had success. You build a bigger one. And you know, you build bigger, increasingly bigger machines. This is uh, my colleague, Tom Sterling. I actually met Tom here at MIT few days after I arrived, we worked on the parallel processing project uh, here at MIT together, and we rejoined efforts at, at NASA and built increasingly large clusters. And the point here isn't that we, oh, we built this machine, we wrote a paper about it, we built a larger machine. We figured out the software, how to make this run, gee, let, let's make a big storage system out of it, and figure out the software for that, tell people how to do it. Let's build a bigger cluster and tell people what we learned doing that, teach people how to build increasingly large clusters. And indeed, we built, you know, some really, really big clusters. Uh, one of the, I would say one of the breakthroughs in history was when we showed people that these machines were far more cost effective, the price performance of these machines uh, far better than traditional supercomputers such as Cray. We got the Gordon Bell Prize, and we were just discussing it over here whether, I think we did the work in 96 and got the prize in 97. Well, that was, that was some old pictures, some history. Let's uh, skip ahead to how things are today. Status of commodity clustering. Commodity clusters today, from those machines where people didn't think they were useful at all, were tied to custom-built supercomputers, Today, commodity clustering dominates high-performance computing. Supercomputing is done on Linux clusters today. Uh, clusters of standard hardware replaced all that custom hardware, and each one of those custom supercomputers had its own unique, really, really primitive operating system. Now, one of the really good things we've done for high-performance computing, you can learn how to run a high-performance machine with your laptop, your desktop system, because the operating system that's going to run on that the largest machines in the world, exactly the same as the one that you're running on your, your desktop system, Linux. You might not think of that as a big thing. It was. 20 years ago, if you wanted to learn how to run a Cray, there were only a few places in the world where you could go, get on a Cray, and learn how to run it. And did that still transfer to any other supercomputer? No, no, it didn't. Linux has fulfilled the promise of the same thing runs on everything from wristwatches up to the world's largest machines. So today, commodity clustering, and especially Linux-based commodity clustering, dominates the high-performance computing world with over 80% of the large machines running Linux. And almost all of them running Linux are commodity clusters. They take individual building blocks, the same kind of server you can <coughs> go out and buy to run a, a single standalone web server. They put them together with a layer of software on top to make them work together high-performance machines instead of custom-built hardware. 
and in the mid-range, low and mid-range, scalable performance computing, Linux space clusters, even a higher percentage. You can't really count those machines. You don't know how many are out there, but we know that Cray basically only sells the high end. Everything mid-range and below is dominated by Linux space clusters. No questions, disagreements at this point? Everybody says yeah. Did they work? Did they solve the problem? We had highly motivated scientists who were willing to put up with almost anything to get more sites. Yeah, they, they went through horrible user experiences, spent days learning how to use the machine. When something went wrong, they patched it down themselves. And that's an example of what we used to do in the old days to do bug fixing. When Saul went wrong, about the KVM switch. Ideally, a cluster should never have a KVM switch. You should never mm -hmm. need to fix a problem on anything but one machine. And part of our quest over time has been how do you get rid of things like that? How do you how do you make it so it's easy to make deal with this one machine? So you don't have to have all that ancillary hardware. It's a great theory. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, some of those old clusters ran for a year between power failures. No, no crashes of uh, the operating system. So it really is the case that you can make a change that you have completely forgotten about that will come back and bite you when the power fails. What does the label say? No poster on the rack of our Oh, uh, the key. The right. one on the right. The right. The left one just says available. That's the one they got, right? Yeah, that one tells about the, how powerful that machine was, how, what processors it had. Right. It had a uh, one gigaflops scaled performance. <laughs> a whole gigaflop right there. <laughs> um, and the one on the right. <laughs> that was describing some application work we did back then. Uh, this was actually the machine we won the Gordon Bell Prize with. It was part of this machine. Uh, Gord, we got the Gordon Bell Prize in the 90s showing a really hard problem that could be done on a cluster. And the really hard problem was gravitational end body. And I like talking about this one because it demonstrates how you have to change your thinking to make things run on a cluster. So 
but once you do, once you change the way you, you think, applications can become more effective. Gravitational in body is a problem where you want to model the evolution of the universe. Interesting aspect of that problem. No matter how far away something is, its gravity, uh, if it's big enough, its gravity is going to have an effect on you. Now, it might be 93 million miles away, but if it's big enough, it's going to cause tides or something like that. So, gravitational in body, every time step, you have to look at all the heavy objects around you, do a computation, compute where you're going to be in the next time step. So every time step, it's an all-to-all -all communication problem. This is obviously a problem you can only solve with the vector symmetry. No other approach will work. Because it's all-to-all, -all, every time step, everything changes. You need to regather all the data, do the computation for each object. Well, there were some really clever people who, who I worked with who figured out how to break this problem up so that you didn't have to have all-to-all -all communication. If, something's, if a group of objects are far enough away, you can treat them as a single heavier object, and their evolution over time doesn't matter until they spread out, until their mass distribution changes. And that's not going to happen very quickly on the scale of the universe. But you want to have very fine time steps because your evolution, how you move, depends upon local objects that are massive. You don't want to forget about the far away ones that you can treat them as a single object. So these people figure out how to treat far away objects <coughs> as a single object, and if you were closer to objects, it broke them apart into subsections. So they figured out a very clever tree structure, and they figured out how to do it on a cluster. Now the great thing about this is they got better results, more accurate results in doing it this way than the traditional way. They could spread the workload over a cluster do far more work, more accurately, more effectively, solve the same problem, get better results, and use a thousand machines simultaneously. So, problems that people thought couldn't be done on clusters in the, the mid-90s would show that they could do them on clusters. And the old wisdom that, well, you know, clusters can solve five or ten percent of the problems, but we have really, really hard problems that you need a single, really fast powerful machine to solve, that wasn't true. In reality, you can solve 95% or more of the physical problems on a cluster more effectively than you could on a train. And that used to be, uh, I, go, I was a heretic for saying something like that, that you could solve problems in clusters. Today everybody says, oh yeah, 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 that was obvious, we knew it, uh, there was no, no question about it. Uh, there are a few problems that you still need very large supercomputers but there are very few problems, effectively, not a large part. I should. I, I think he was asking if you were know, just a little bit of paper stuck on the far right. Oh, this one here? The name of the machine. Yeah. Oh, the, uh, the Nagling was the, one of the swords available. Basically, uh, I'll, I'll answer the question about Beowulf. Beowulf uh, is a Scandinavian legend, but it's known for being the oldest written English. Uh, one little characteristic of Beowulf is all the swords that were named, but basically all the swords failed Beowulf at one time or another. Uh, so, <coughs> yeah, Nagling was one, one of the swords of Beowulf that, that failed Beowulf. Yeah. Great thing with Beowulf, you've got lots of names to choose from. Bad thing. I did a fast count. Is there about 200 machines in that cluster, or is there a lot more outside the picture? Uh, this, I think, only had 100 machines in the cluster. I, I, I counted, I think, 100 per side. Uh, or 10 by, by, oh, yeah, you're right. I'm trying to recall it back. This was uh, either 100 or 128. Okay. And then the next picture, is is that that same room from from but from the opposite corner? This was a rearranged version of that cluster when it was expanded. And, and I noticed that some of the machines have their sides off. Is that just so that we can see that they're really machines, or was, was that part of the air conditioning system? <laughs> <laughs> it was not part of the air conditioning system. One of the things we had to worry about a lot back then was cooling. Uh, but it was made easier because 
because these were not very dense machines. One of the early criticisms of Beowulf clusters, um, you put this big PC case, lots of air in it, very low density. And the complaint used to be, uh, well, even if you could build clusters, they're far too big to, to do anything useful with. And we've got to ha have a cray because the machine room, uh, you know, you have to go to the meds machine. Today, the problem is actually clusters are too small. You could have a rack that uses far more power than is available. Many clusters today have higher thermal density than the most dense air-cooled cray. So uh, that, that might have been just to show the machines. It might have been because when something goes wrong, it's easier to just move the sides off and count on the, the side of the machine adjacent to it. Uh, and things went wrong more often with that hardware than it does today. So one of the things that it taught us was you've got to build diagnostics into everything you do. You gotta, before you load a kernel, make sure the memory is there, make sure it works. Uh, don't count on your storage to be there, don't count on it working. And the larger the cluster you build, the less you can count on the hardware working. 99% of it might work, but when you have a thousand nodes, that's 10 things that are broken. No. Uh, yes, question? Are you saying that, um, that the problem now is that they're too small, and that the kitchen is really some sort of cheap and compact area um, for cooling and power to help batch it? Um, I'm sort of running into that myself. solve the problem of power density? Uh, well, you build more efficient machines, but that has a limit. So you can put in a more efficient power supply. You can go from 80 to 90% efficient. Well, it was easy to go from 60% efficient to 80% efficient. So you got rid of a lot of excess heat that way. 80 to 90% efficient power supplies, you're saving less power, and you've really reached the limit. My theory is that really the only way to solve the power problem in a cluster is to turn machines completely off. So we're limited by how power efficient AMD and Intel make their processors. They're working hard on the problem, so there's not a lot of there's not a lot of fat to be trimmed there. The, the real solution is being able to turn machines off and turn them back on quickly when a problem of, uh, computational problem appears, one that needs to be solved. It doesn't solve it when you have a three week problem that's occupying all of the machines. 100% of their time. Right, plus you have to have that many computers in order to turn off the machines in order to still reach a point of power. Yeah. Yeah, you still have to be able to support maximum power. One of the things you can do, though, is if you have temporary workload, turn on all the machines. When you need to cut back, turn off some of the machines. The implication here is you have to be able to be, be able to turn off those machines bring them back online quickly, and do it in a way that's consistent. If you turn off all your machines and you try to install an updated package, you have to have a software mechanism that supports that. So it's the important element here, oh, your software has to be able to deal with machines that aren't powered on when you do an update. How about something like the APC system or the racks that would pull in your input from the racks? So, uh, it's part of the problem. Jo Josh here is our, one of our power so experts. That's part of the problem, but that well, it, it solves part of the problem, but what you really need is you need to have part of the software issues. Is you need to be able to investigate what workload you're doing. So you have to have sort of intelligence built on the software stack all the way up to the application stack, right? You have to know that you know three hours from now I'm going to need this many nodes, and you have to. Have the APC solution helps because it gives you the ability to sort of monitor the airflow, but you have to be able to have the software to sort of look at the whole environment. So it's not just being able to monitor their temperature, it's being able to do something about it. And uh, going flipping to the bottom here, yes, yeah, it turns out it, this is all a software problem. It's not can you build a machine, can you put an application on it? How do you do the software to make it possible to do that kind of thing? And that's what my talk today is about. Basically, commodity off the shelf hardware, independent machines, how do we make it look like a single system? Well, with supercomputers, you took the chips, 
put a lot of hardware effort into making it look like a single system. Today, it's full machines, that's your hardware building block, we, we join them together with a software layer. How do we used to do this? We used to do a full workstation-oriented install on every machine. So we were managing uh, basically uh, a whole set of workstations, even though it was a single computational cluster. Full Linux install, and of course you can strip it down, you can remove things you don't think are needed, but that's a really manual process. So every machine's running everything you would need for a standalone operating system to install. And we built parallel shells, we put, built blue scripts on top to make it easier. We automated the install, we automated the updates, but it still has significant flaws. What if a machine is down? What if you add new machines? You can automate it and install, but then you have to update all the systems, the applications since that install was done. You can do that for the system software, you often can't do it for the end user application software. There's a whole set of problems to be solved, even if you automate the install, you haven't solved the rest of the operational problems. <coughs> we used to do this. We, for years, built manual clusters with a full install, and we thought better ways to do that full install and manage it over time. Now, what do we do wrong when we were building clusters? We had the opportunity to stand back and look at it. What, was the pr what problem were we facing? And the number one problem is complexity. Computers, they're as complicated as anybody ever wants to deal with. That's sort of my rule over the long term. If you make some parts simpler, more is added in. A single machine is as, as complex as most people will deal with, and that will just be true for all time. If you put a hundred or a thousand together, you don't want it to be a hundred or a thousand times more complex than anybody wants to deal with. Another problem is clusters all required extensive training to install, configure, and use. They didn't look like the machine on people's desktop. They were the machine on people's desktop plus a whole software layer on top that did all of the utility things you needed. And especially long-term administration and updates were difficult, error-prone, had a lot of complexity, they weren't consistent. Any way you want to put about it, put it, it was, yeah, anybody can script and install, like anybody can run Kickstart on a thousand machines, but what do you do a month from now, three months from now, or a year from now, you've got a thousand machines to do administration. And finally, the kinds of machines we were building back then were only statically scalable. When we built a 16 node cluster, we set up a 16 node cluster. A hundred node cluster, we set it all up knowing it would be 100 nodes. One of the things we missed was the value of a cluster is I can start with a two node cluster, add a third machine, add 100 machines. The hardware is supported. Why didn't the software? We want machines that we can just plug in a new node to the cluster, and the cluster grows in power. It automatically accepts that new node. Even if we weren't planning to plug in 1,000, we should always start it planning system that can accept a thousand nodes and without reloading the software each time. I'm going to skip this, skip this slide because I want to get into the technical stuff. Before the technical stuff, let's start with some definitions because everybody thinks they know what a cluster means. We'll start with the right definition. That's my definition. So we'll just accept this as, as gospel. Clustering, independent computers, machines capable of standalone operation. So Workstations, yes. Custom-built machines, eh, probably not. You combine them into a unified system, and that's the key. We're trying to make it look like a single system in some aspect, or in as many aspects as possible. And how do you do that? You do it either through hardware, you wire them together, or through a software layer where the software makes it look like a single system. So we're taking independent machines, trying to make them look like one. How do you do it? With software. I like talking about this sometimes in terms of virtualization. Uh, virtualization, for virtual machines, a lot of people think of it as, well, you take one physical machine, you run a bunch of virtual machines. What we're trying to do is take a whole bunch of physical machines and make it look like a single virtual machine. And just to distinguish it between from grids, utility computing, cloud computing, etc. 
a grid starts with full installed machines. You're basically trying to use somebody else's machine. They assume that the environment already exists and you're trying to figure out how to run a program over on somebody else's fully installed machine. Cluster software has to deal with everything from the ground up. They create that environment, that perfect install that you can later run a remote application on. So grids, something on top of full installed machines, grid software always assumes a perfectly working full install and then you load the software layer on top. Clusters, it's the thing that creates that perfect full install. It starts from bare metal, does the booting, the provisioning, sets up an environment, makes sure all that underlying software, the operating system So again, back to the idea of a cluster. You know, for cluster software, what should we be aiming towards? We should be aiming towards a unified view, taking a whole bunch of machines, making them as simple to use as a single machine. So a good cluster system virtualizes. It creates a unified single view of all of those five, ten, 100, 1,000 machines. So what we want to create is, for lack of a better term, a single system illusion or a single system image. And actually, uh, I'll, I'll accept some, but single system image means this questions now. We can save them until later. So what we're trying to do, move from full install on every machine to something that looks like a single machine to the end users. And we came up with a really innovative approach to do it. The innovative approach requires lots of different software elements. And I'm going to dive down into the technical but the idea here is we do a single full install on a master machine. We'll call it a master machine because everything else is a, all the other nodes are compute nodes. They operate as slaves off the master machine. So full install master machine, everything else is compute nodes. Rather than multiple full installs, you just have to install one standard Linux environment and it handles, it automatically boosts all of the rest of the So what do we do and how do we do it and how is it different? We start out with the what do we do? Full install a master machine, network boots all of the rest of the machines, treats them as diskless, and builds up a lightweight install on that just powerful enough to run the application. End users log in only to the master node. They think that's the entire virtual machine. And when you plug in compute nodes, the master node automatically gives them the kernel they need and just enough to run the application. So it's very similar to a quick start, sort of. Well, good good question, but exactly the opposite. So quick start is Red Hat's way of installing Linux. So basically you're, you're doing the initial part of the quick start where you're pushing the image to the FTP machines and they, they boot the image that they're going to run. We're doing something that boots the machine and lets you install packages, builds the install, and then reboots the machine. Right, well, well the, full install the initial level. start is you load an image and start the machine with an, it's an image that it pulls off the network. It's similar to a thin computing environment or... What is a thin computing environment? But it doesn't install packages. It doesn't automate an install. No, it just, it, it just, it just starts the machine. It starts the machine. It, the master will Make sure you 
have this executable cache, make sure you have this library cache. Oh, now you have enough to run this application. Run this application and give me some results. So it's all run from an init RD? It's, a, it's an, all run from an init, init RD. When we first did this system in 99 and 2000, init RDs, especially network init RDs, were new technology in Linux. And we developed, uh, in parallel with other people, some of that technology to run everything out of RAM with the modularized kernel. So yes, it's, it's running a system out of RAM, and when it runs an application, it actually creates a subdirectory that's effectively a change root. Inside of the uh, initRD, we do a pivot root uh, up to twice, ac actually. But yeah, essentially we're running something akin to hypervisor out of the init RD, and that's what the master machine has. Yes? What's the status of the node operating system before it goes from the application to the code? The, uh, back when we measured it, we passed a, the initial image is about the size of a floppy, because we wanted to make sure all the initial images were tiny and would fit on the floppy. Then, the static the initial part, again, an init RD we download, start up, occupy somewhere between 10 and 50 megabytes. The, the most recent release ships by default with six and a half megabytes. That's the sort of the out of the box configuration. So you could run a compute node maybe with 64 megabytes of memory. Now, you would never want to run an application at that point, but it can do what it needs to do in a very tiny amount of memory. That's, that's important to know because one of the things you can do with a compute node done this way is run a very large memory application. And this is a tech, booting machines this way is a technique that you don't have a mixed up virtual to physical memory that way. Uh, no, let, me, let me step back and describe that in a different way. Ideally, if you have a really large memory application, you would like to start that application on fresh booted hardware because that way you have a clean mapping from virtual memory, your virtual memory address space, and your physical memory address space. Whenever you have continuous physical memory, you can group that together and make it a single mapping, a four megabyte page mapping, or even a four gigabyte page mapping, rather than a thousand mappings to different physical pages. You can run things much more effectively the problem is, when you normally boot an operating system, it does a whole bunch of work after you've powered on before it can run the application. It mixes up physical memory, it uses a page here and a page there, and the virtual to physical memory mapping is randomized. You've just done so much work during the boot process, so many things have started up, uh, hundreds of processes. Uh, I think uh, two years ago, Dave Jones did a study that said 80,000 file open typical Linux boot up sequence. So you've done an immense amount of work. Your kernel has used, touched all of memory at that point. You don't have a clean map. What you'd like to do is power on the machine, put the application there, and run it with nothing else running. This is as close as we can get to that right now. Because you're not running the full operating system with compute node, you're running the bare minimum. So now I'll go into some of the layers that make this possible. I'll go back to refer to the architecture diagram, but we're going to get into some of the technical elements. And the first one, booting and provisioning. Booting is a key part of a cluster. If you do a full install on every machine, and you screw up something, you screw up all of the machines. Which one, one of the ways around that is having a, a booting mechanism that allows you to recover from errors even better, never to make an error that isn't recoverable. Uh, process creation, monitoring, control. Uh, so, <coughs> so everybody knows about our shell to start up a process on a remote machine. You give the name of a program, it basically passes that command line over to a remote machine. That's a basic way to make a cluster. It's the way we made the early clusters. So process creation, people understand you need to create a process over there. The next step is 
you have to monitor the processes on the blockchains. And you don't think about that until you build a large cluster and operate it for a few months. You think, gee, I want to find out what all my processes are doing. Well, the next step after that is, and now I know what the processes are doing, I want to be able to do something about it, kill them, send them, uh, send them signals to do other things. Um, so process creation, monitoring, control, one element of putting together a cluster system. That leads into an update consistency model. Well, how do I know that what I'm running on a remote machine is the same as what I'm running on a local machine? And you can tie that in, and I'll tell you how we, we do that. And finally, we name services, file systems, all these elements you need to put together to make this cluster easy and, or even feasible to operate. So booting. booting We want reliable booting. Again, a thousand machines, if you're 99% reliable, well, for that, that's not good enough. You're going to lose 10, 10 machines, and if they're densely packed in racks, even locating the machine to press the reset button is, is a hard task. You want to automatically be able to scale it up. You want to design a system, you only have 10 machines now, but you want it to be able to do 1,000 or 10,000 machines. You want centralized control and updates, even when machines are at all. You want reporting if something goes wrong because you know, we showed pictures of the machine room KVM switches. You want to be able to detect so you don't have to have KVM switches. You want to be able to go into that piece of hardware and figure out what's wrong with it, figure out whether you actually need to pull the hardware or if it's really a software problem. And finally, for reliability, you don't want to depend on anything that's local or why? Because if anything's there, if there's anything there that can be uh, impact the booting process, can impact the booting process to keep the machine from booting. <coughs> so what, what are our challenges? We want to boot a remote machine. We want to create an execution environment from scratch. Uh, people often think of these in isolation, installing and booting, but they're actually the same thing we can boot a machine and do the install automatically, we've solved both problems at once. And again, we have an opportunity here that you might not have with your single machine install. An op a cluster, almost everything, well, we want the software installed to do the same. And if we treat, treat it as a master-based install with compute nodes, we always have a reference machine. Always have a machine that has all the software. So our solution here, once you think about all the problems, pretty obvious. We want a network boot. We want a full install on a machine that automatically boots all the rest of the machines that we have. That gives us a single point of control, a single point of update. Now we're only problem is the easy ones of reliability and diagnostics. How do you make this scale up? So we have an integrated automatic network boot that has hardware reporting as part of its, part of how it operates. So here's something you can do when you do a network boot. In the pre-boot environment, in the Pixie environment, that's go into your machine, that's, that's what is what does the network boot on your machine. The master can actually download an arbitrary program in there. And you can find out what that hardware is. And you can pass it the right kernel based on that hardware. How, how many people in here know about Pixie? A lot of you probably use, uh, if you boot machines, you use Pixie Linux to boot machines. Uh, <coughs> Pixie Linux downloads a little DOS level program, a BIOS level program, that basically comes back to the, comes back and asks the machine, somebody, give me a boot image. So you can actually download something that initially says, oh, this is a, a 64 bit Intel machine, I'd like a boot image that has that. I've got this network adapter, I'd like a boot image that supports it. And the neat thing about this is you only need a little bit of the hardware to work. You only need the CPU, the memory, and the NIC to work. And you know, that little image you download, Pixie Linux, only needs to say, uh, pass, me, pass me something that supports this hardware. And that initial 
horrendous, which you asked about before, our approach is we have it only say, what do I do now? And the remaining configuration is driven by the master. So the difference here is we're not downloading a full operating system and saying, here, go off and install this, or here, go off and run this, and come back when you're completely booted. What we do is we download a little image whose only purpose is to do as little as possible with what you come back to the master. So as little can go wrong as possible. So we want a narrow window between booting the kernel and being under control of the master. Part of the magic we have is we, we found that traditional Pixie servers weren't reliable enough. We had to write our own Pixie server. One of the bad things about Pixie, one of the bad things about traditional network booting in Pixie is it uses some pretty primitive protocols. And if you're booting 30 machines, almost 100% reliable. If you're booting 40 machines, you start losing machines where you're booting from. And it's because of how primitive the TFTP protocol inside of Pixie is. What we did is we <coughs> wrote our own server so that when it detects you're starting to lose packets, or you're booting too many machines, or you're exceeding your bandwidth limit, it, instead of responding as machines request next chunk of the file with TFTP, we pass up the next chunk of the file to everyone before going around, round, we do a round robin fashion. So initially we act like a regular Pixie server. We serve files as quickly as possible to anybody to ask. Once we detect an overload, if somebody's dropping out of the boot sequence, we go around one by one and make sure that everybody has a fair share of the boot packet. That way we don't basically add it to your network. And none of the traditional DHCP servers made this easier or reliable to detect that a new machine is trying to boot, detect what hardware is there, automatically update all the rest of the configuration files. When you write your own Pixie server, you can make that happen automatically. Another thing we can do is put in more diagnostics. And that's something we're working on right now. We want to be able to find out their state is, what they've downloaded, what, what, what states we think were at in the files that were sent. And what we're adding into the Pixie server right now is scoreboarding, where it publishes in a shared memory image how far it's gotten into the machine. You might think, Pixie, oh, that happens in less than a second. How could I possibly track what's going on? Well, when you're booting 10,000 machines, you put a bandwidth limit to the server. It might take a few seconds to download the kernel and make random. More importantly, if something goes wrong, you want to know the exact point where it went wrong. You want to know how to fix booting problems. You want to know, well, this machine downloaded this file and never came back to us. Part of the diagnosability, even trivial things uh, or unlikely problems occur when you have a large enough number of machines. When you're doing those initial diagnostics, are you able to uh, differentiate We don't do any differences like that. And admittedly, this is an area where we're working on it, and I think we can do a lot better than we're doing right now. The scoreboarding is something we're putting in to find out where in the boot process we are. We don't, <coughs> this thing uh, I had in the previous page, the basic hardware reporting, we don't do a good job of that right now. In theory, you can find out everything about that motherboard before you pass it a Linux kernel. In theory, we can look through all the kernel images we have and say, ah, this one is the optimal kernel for this, uh, for this Opteron SMP machine. And for this Opteron uniprocessor machine, this really old one, we'll pass it a uniprocessor kernel because it works a little bit more efficiently. That's something we can't do today. We can manually set that up, but we can't look through
proposed this set of kernels we have, what motherboard that is with, and what NIC it is, and pass it the best kernel and the best in that branch. I was thinking more in terms of tracking failures. Like if you have a system that had 16 gig and suddenly it boots only with 12. What we do today, and we, we boot up, comes back to the master, it says, what do I do now? One of the early things we do is DMI decode. Here, run this DMI decode program. This is before it mounts the disks or does anything else. We get back the results, we put it into database. That's, uh, okay, so we put it into database. That's pretty much useless. It's all there, but we're not comparing against what was there before. Is it changed? Is it something new we need to do? We've got, we know how to do it, we just haven't moved to that point yet. <laughs> so, uh, we've got the approach there. And I do think the right approach is before you mount any file system, before you load anything else, find out all about the hardware and detect real problems. One of the things I'd like to put in, I was talking with uh, Marty Connor from the, Ether, the Etherroot project today about, I've wanted to do this for years, before we pass it a Linux kernel, in the Pixie Linux environment, in that early environment, we should be doing a mem test. We should do, be doing a basic mem test to make sure that our CPU, our memory, all work well enough before we pass it on this time. That way, if you have bad memory, you know instead of passing a Linux kernel, and you never hear from the machine again. Or you could just play with um, KXAC and have a generic kernel that you can use. <coughs> Those are your diagnostics in a feature rich environment, and then KXAC into the specific kernel you want to run. It doesn't solve the problem where you have a memory memory error above one meg. You still need to have would like to be able to pass a really simple memory test. Is this machine healthy enough to run a Linux kernel? And once you run the Linux kernel, why can't exact into another? Because that way you have a full environment to run your DMI decode and everything else without having to write your own OS just to run things like decode and bias DMI and stuff like that. Well, the way we used to do this, we had, used to have a really generic kernel. Yeah. We had something before KXAC, uh, two kernel Mate, which you're running a generic Linux kernel, two kernel Mate slid another kernel in underneath sure. and switched to it. Sure. KXEC does the same thing in a more standard way. Yeah. Once, now that we have Pixie Boot, my assertion is we don't need KXEC. KXEC doesn't do anything useful for you. If you want to rewrite all these tools, then that's fine. But you need to, the point is you need to write all this DMI decoding, or tools like that, you need to write for your Pixie environment because they don't exist right oh, now. So no, we don't. We, we do DMI decode after we are running a standard Linux kernel. Right, but if you're going to do that in the, at the Pixie level, which you'll want to do if you want to determine which kernel to boot specifically. Ah, but you don't, because in the Pixie level, you have access to the processor family, you have access to the bus location and PCI ID of the network card, and a few basic pieces of information about and That's enough for you? Well, that's enough to pick the right kernel okay. and the right init RAM base. Because one of the magic things, or one of the good things we're doing, is we're not touching the hard disk, we're not touching any of the rest of the hardware. Sure. We want to activate as little as possible before running a standard environment. Now what you're talking about is, that when you're designing a system like this, a lot of people will grab onto something like the Pixie environment, or an early environment, a basic Linux without all the tools there. And the challenge is, oh, well, now you have you have to learn about the Pixie environment. Now you have to learn about this constrained and then RAM disk environment. And people who want to write applications have all these different environments they have to remember the rules about. What we want to do is minimize it. We automatically detect the Pixie environment, and from then on you have a standard, all the standard Linux tools there. And with the k exact approach, you, you're guaranteeing you have a different kernel and a minimal environment there so yes, it's but different rules. Right, but that's only, again, that's only, that's kind of the vendor level piece of it, that you're not, you're assuming the users are not writing the diagnostic code that you're providing that as kind of a, a single image that goes on there and runs first. It's a different model. If you want to give people access yeah. to run their own diagnostics, then it makes more sense to run that inside the code. And, and yeah, we, we want to be able to, to customize that environment. Okay. We want to give the users power to customize that environment without having that restricted 
well, what tools do we have to load in the init RAM disk? Okay. And yeah, I think this model is much better <coughs> than the way Linux workstation vendors have been going, where, yeah, we're building, building out a NIT RAM disk bigger and bigger, and we've got a whole bunch of things that have to have to report comes back and talks us to network. Our model is we want to get on the network under control of the master as soon as possible with as few risks as possible and with as few actions. And so one of the questions there is that um, when you, obviously in the past what you would do is solely, you know, base the image detection on the MAC address or something in the machine requesting. Yes. I assume that's what you've always done in the past. You just get a request, come in, okay, I know this system because it's been configured previously in my database of available systems, give it this image that, you know, I know works on this machine. Um, and clearly you're trying to get away from that. I, is that because you're finding that you really just want this dynamic ability to just throw new hardware in and not have to go and configure it ahead of time? Exactly. I want to be able to deploy, I want to give somebody a master machine yeah. and they can plug in any hardware, they can plug in a laptop, oh, that's a 32-bit laptop, you can only pass it a 32-bit kernel. Oh, this is a 64-bit uniprocessor, I'll give it the right kernel. I don't want the end user to have to make a decision, the administrator to have to make a decision. And if something goes wrong, I want to be able to report back, you know, I tried to boot this machine, it claimed it was an x86 with this unknown PCI ID, I passed it on the RAM desk, it never came back. Okay. Now, even better, I'd like it to download that little pixie thing, it come back and say, give me a minute RAM disk with this PCI ID of the NIC. And the master says, I've never heard of that. I looked it up in my database, my configuration file, which by the way only has to exist on the master in one place. I'm gonna go ask my upstream OS vendor, give, give me uh, you know, that device driver. Mm -hmm. And the upstream OS vendor's web server says, uh, yeah, I've got it here. Oh, for that one, no, no, I don't. I'm gonna, you know, pass it to the uh, kernel maintainers, and the kernel maintainers will will get this thing that says, oh, there's this new piece of hardware, and 10,000 people suddenly have this new piece of hardware. So maybe I should have a device driver writer. Uh, so you, you and I should talk about that later on because I'm actually running a project with the Linux Foundation, the driver the, backports. Yeah. Game. So we should talk about that because we're actually building a service that will do precisely that. Here's this PCI ID. Um, or other mod alias string, give me the driver that works with this. Yeah. Well, so, so there you go. So, so we've got a service that will do that. Here's an architecture we can go the whole way through. We network boot a machine. We don't have the driver on the master machine. Yeah. It can go back and ask the OS vendor. Absolutely. And so then go back and ask humans to write a driver for it. And the next time, you know, we might have to turn off this machine for a day. Next time we try to boot it up, we'll go back and we'll ask the master. And the master says, I don't have it, but let hold on a second. Oh, by the way, you have to have a Pixie server to say, hold on a second, right. I'm, I'm going to look here. You go on the web server of the OS vendor, he says, ha, ah, I've got this new driver. Here's the source code if you need to compile it, or here's the pre-compiled version. Put it in, he will automatically update it to the operating system of the master. You can automatically provide that driver to the people. Now, two different kinds of drivers for this. Network drivers, because you have to be able to do that for the slave node to talk and get into the Linux environment all the rest of the drivers in the world, which the master basically says, give me your uh, PCI ID list, pass proc PCI, looks it up, master is the only one that needs that table, can be updated while the, all the different nodes are on. It says, here's the drivers for it. Mm -hmm. So we've got an architecture here where we can automatically update drivers for your entire compute room, even for new hardware that we've never seen before or is not installed. I don't think there's any other way to, that we can do that. We only have to have one machine who can boot. Everything else can report upstream, get the drivers, install brand new machines. I can see everybody else is bored by this, but yeah, to me this is an incredibly way. interesting way of getting hardware support for everything, getting it automatically reported back to people who can make a difference, to people who write device drivers. Yeah, well, we're trying to solve this for Rel, and it's a completely different uh, domain, so, but we'll talk about that later on. Well, you can see how it solves the problem here. Now, right. it's a special case. Clusters yeah. and compute rooms, we can automate the process. We don't need a human involved. And that's one of our goals here. System administrators, we want them dealing with the hard problems, not the things we can automate. And we can automate what kernel to pass, all the configurations, configure the operating system. 
system for the hardware that's out there. Let the humans deal with the hard problems by the automated system. Two quick things. First of all, the, the pixel jar that's on this blue screen here, is it the only the, the Pixie server? Uh, we on and off talked about publishing that. Almost everything else here we've published. The Pixie server, uh, the first time I went to publish it, I, I wrote the initial version of Pixie server. There was a lot of claims that, oh, you use the ISC DHCP server, you look at the log output, you script it, you automatically update the uh, DHCP configuration file, and that's good enough. You're, we, don't, we don't need your stuff. Um, I help people write TFTP servers, point them in the right direction to make them more reliable. But right now, we're not publishing the Pixie server. And every few months, we go back and revisit that. I think we're going to publish it soon. But, but yeah, this isn't something we've published. Most of the other neat things we've done, we've published as open source. And we've published the Pixie server, we'll publish it as open source GPL. But okay. yeah. Second thing is, uh, I, I mean, it sounds very interesting. I think you were just discussing about the, the dynamic view that, that you determine the, the device drives and the information that comes out of it. But I, I wonder how actually, how useful it would actually be in a device like mine, where mostly you have these somewhat predictable So two things. First of all, it's the difference between me building my cluster and me building a software system that lets everybody else automatically build a cluster. So I'm trying to solve the problem in a way that's replicatable over the rest of the world. And yeah, if I were building, buy, go out and buy hardware that's all the same, I, I don't have to worry about the automatic detection and update of, of the cluster. Sounds like um, you're also talking about re repurposing general you're, you're talking about cases where you've got a, a university like this with machines on the weekend, you want to repurpose a lab into a compute yeah. environment, something like that, right? That's what you're talking about as well. Yeah, and that leads into long-term maintenance because right. you bought 100 machines, they're all the same. One breaks, you send it back to the vendor, and you get a motherboard that looks exactly the same but has no version for the chip on it. And suddenly you have to deal with hardware heterogeneity. Suddenly the machines are different. Well, you buy another 100 machines, you want to buy the latest and greatest, they're all different. You have two clusters, and somebody says, well, let's, you know, we've got our two clusters, both in the same machine room. You know, we were different groups before, but let's join them and make a big cluster. There's, there's lots of scenarios. Many sites won't have to deal with this sort of hardware, but again, if we build the software correctly, we do some hard work up front, but then it's really easy to deal with all the different hardware. The sites that have many different in the audience with the segue. Okay, so now what we've done, we've downloaded the kernel and then it ran us and come back to the master and said, what do I do now? Um, so what we have to do now is provision the machine. We've got two choices. We can do a full install of local disk. And detecting the disk, that means assuming local disks. Um, we can do a full install just like Kickstart would, make it a real full machine, and then manage it like a workstation. Well, what if we wanted to do something lighter? What are our options? What if we want to make this a diskless machine, but not now file system? What if we want to make it a sufficient diskless machine? Well, uh, it has a whole bunch of advantages. One, you, you pass a new environment to it each time. So there's nothing you can screw up in that compute node that will keep it from booting, or will make it wrong for the next time. So we integrate that with the process starting. Um, skip ahead here. And what we do, again, full install on the master node, standard Linux install, and we want lightweight compute nodes that just only run the application. And we've built that into, provision, into the process starting system. We combine provisioning and process starting. like our shell or S shell, except we had different goals for it. Um, we 
want it to return the same result as local execution. So we want it to start a remote process, not by its name. Not, so you go R shell to remote node, here, run the program test. And you had just compiled test in your local directory. Well, test is an unfortunate name, because there is a program out there on a standard Linux machine named test. And it's not the program that's in your local directory named test. Test returns a zero or a one based on some expression you've given. So maybe that's a contrived example. But say I, you know, I want to run uh, my application that I've just freshly recompiled with my local machine on the remote machine. Well, you know, that remote machine didn't get the update I did if I'm running my old version of the application because it happened to have the same name. That's an interesting uh, call by name or, or call by object. I want this to run this program and I have the local machine, not the remote machine. Not one that's named the same, but this exact executing thing. So what we did to make, you know, that's, that's part of consistency. We built a remote execution system where we say, here, run this program, and here's the path name and version number that I want you to run, and here are the libraries and executables by the path name and version that it needs to run that execution. By doing that, we automatically get consistency. If it exists on the master machine on this name, we can run that exact version on the remote machine. And by running the exact version, we get the exact same result. Modular processor differences, which we won't talk about. But we're running the same version, the same executable with the same environment. We'll get the same result. What's good about this model? Because that's a single point in space and time where we know the right version of the application, what libraries it will link to, the environment, what user starts it up, and we can pass it out to the remote machine as a bundle and say, here, run this. Uh, we're assured at that instant in time of knowing which user started it, all the credentials we need, the binaries and libraries are accessible. And yeah, this is going to be a little painful at first because we're passing this whole big object out there to say, here, run this application, run this executable. But we can optimize that. We can optimize it by making a caching system. So instead of saying, here, run this big memory image, run this thing, takes a lot of network bandwidth, we, we break it up and we say, here, make sure you have this executable you have this library by version. First time, we cache it. But we're building up, we're provisioning the machine incrementally with just what we need to run. We're not doing this like a network file system or a traditional one. Instead of saying, we're caching, we're building up just the parts of the distribution that computer and need to run. You're setting it on a whole file basis as opposed to a traditional page command. That's right. NFS would page it in 4K page or 8K page at a time, and you wouldn't quite get the whole library executable. And you'll constantly need to go back to the file server. You'll constantly need to go back to the file server in a very inefficient way, asking for a template. And what we do here, part of the cleverness is, we send here, cache this whole file, cache this whole library, and now you have what you need to run for all time. You never need to come back to the file. Bunch of advantages. Yeah, everything's on the machine. We don't need to go back and page it in. We're transferring it in big chunks, so that's much more effective. We can use TCP offload to do it. And you can you don't have to go back to the master. You can ask uh, some other file server first, hey, can you pass me this machine? You can even ask one of your fellow nodes, do you have this? Actually, that's a bad idea because they're probably busy doing work. But in theory, you can have the cluster ask, you know, So yeah, caching by whole files is the thing. Now what's the neat thing here? We have a consistent process starting mechanism that guarantees we have the right version, and we've automated part of the provision. We've automated the loading up the compute node with the application. But we've done it in a very efficient way. It's only caching the executables and libraries that actually need to run. We're not passing a whole OS install, everything that it might possibly need, which is everything just the little chunks it actually needs to run that application. So when I say we run DMI decode, that's one of the early things. We tell the remote machine here, make sure you cache the DMI
my decode application and, oh yeah, it requires these libraries, make sure you cache those. And so everything we can run on the master machine is some level of decode at that time. And I'm thinking of like when I have to set up a CA3 environment or something, I have to go through the process of finding all of the dependent libraries in the, in the single shell that you want to install in the CA3. You know, how do you how do you really handle all the complex, you know, libraries involving wire quality or libraries that are vulnerable to application code? I mean, it sounds great to have a really simple test, but do the you know, any sort of complex test that would actually include well, like hundreds of libraries. Okay. The weak point of this. This handles all the traditional Unix processes, Linux processes, where I'm running this executable and I know right away I need these libraries and this ex exact version of the executable. When you move to running a shell script, well, the shell script wants to run a whole bunch of programs, and that's when you have to start doing less obvious things. Shell script, uh, simple way to handle it. You mount, NFS mount, a reference copy of the OS so that you know in the shell script, basically so you can look up the binary name. It's more complicated when we're running something like a Java or a Perl environment where you actually need the, what Perl thinks is libraries, the operating thing, system thinks is a data file. There, you, add, you start needing to use a network file system. NFS now. But we've still handled the bulk of the problem. Uh, we still handled the, the case where your file server it has gone away and you need to page in something from the executable. And in a cluster, if one machine is doing it, they're all doing it. They're all hitting the file server at once. If we remove that kind of file server traffic for the executables, we solve most of the problem. No, we have it built into the system, the potential. The question here is about multicast. Uh, a lot of people think multicast solves the problem inside the cluster. Multicast is uh, taking advantage of Ethernet's ability to send a packet, and everybody hears the packet and receives it. That's the old way Ethernet used to work. Ethernet no longer really does multicast. The switches replicate the packet for you if you'd like long time ago, we switched everything we did to a multicast model, so that if one machine was caching a file, they all could listen in and cache that same executable at the same time. Uh, a lot of different elements of the system have multicast that can be turned on. That turned out to be a huge disaster. Most switches handle multicast traffic either like broadcast traffic or in a substandard broadcast traffic. When the switches get loaded, that's the first traffic they toss out. So you find that multicast looks great until you get enough machines and suddenly it all falls over. And then when you go to test it, it works great again. So it's very network load sensitive. Multicast is a bad thing. We used to have a slide saying multicast bad. Looks good in theory. It's a good parlor trick, but doesn't actually work. Uh, I should do a time check here. I want to make sure Josh gets. Make sure that uh, uh, we find out why they're not at the restaurants or whatever. Yeah. 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 About half an hour before we wrap up the meeting. Yeah, I'm going to make sure that, that Josh gets to talk. So I talked about two elements that were essential: the booting element and the pro initial provisioning. And the provisioning is built into the process creation monitoring control hardware system. So. You understand how to boot a machine or, or a compute node, how to go out and detect the hardware, pass exactly the right kernel, a minimal RAM disk, and the only thing it does is come back to the master and says, what do I do now? That gives us the opportunity to, to go out. The master says to the machine, tell me about the rest of your hardware. And based on that, it looks it up in a table and says, here, load these device drivers. So at that point, we can mount disks to support, well, the, the rest of what's going on. Important element here. We're not going through doing all of this blind and when everything's set up, we're live on the network. Uh, a typical full
full install, two minutes to boot, five minutes to boot for a lot of disks. During those two to five minutes from booting the machine to coming live on the network, a lot can go wrong. Our goal here is to minimize what can go wrong. It comes back to the master says, what do I do now? And it's the master that says, here, load this support to the file system. Here, mount the file system. If the machine ever fails to respond, we know it exactly which step it didn't respond. So if we make a mistake, if we make a thousand machines unbootable, we change that little script on the master that sets up the machines, not the thousand machines install on a thousand machines that we're trying to boot when we make a mistake. So <coughs> before I get to uh, five minutes too deep into it, you know, I want to put in my pitch for free open source software. You know, what's that ever done for high performance computing? Um, it actually made all of this possible. So I've talked about a lot of system level things here. Uh, one of the things I didn't get to that's inside of our system is when we create a remote process, we keep a process table entry on the master machine for every remote, remote process we start. And the remote machine, as it's executing every second, it sends back a status pattern, an RUSIC packet for that process, and we stuff that into the kernel of the master. Now that lets us track all of the processes running on all the remote machines as if they were running on the master machine. If you run top of the master machine, you see all of the everything running over the cluster as if we're running locally. Better than just being able to monitor it, we can control it. Suspend it, kill it, put it in the background, nice it, do all those things you might without learning any new commands. Tie it back into this concept. Now how can we do something like that? We couldn't have done that. Our boot system. If we had a proprietary operating system, we wouldn't know enough about the internal details. We wouldn't be able to modify the kernel. We wouldn't know that applications would work on a cluster. So open source software actually made this kind of commodity clustering possible. A commercial proprietary vendor could have done it with their operating system, but they wouldn't necessarily have to do it. Say you were a large operating system application vendor who serve primarily a workstation and user oriented market. You might not even have a motivation to put good networking into your operating system until somebody goes to balk your user community to manage it. You certainly wouldn't have the motivation to build a cluster operating system until you had no other market to look for. So people who want to build specialty machines, you know, high performance machines, one to five percent of the market. Uh, it's a negligible market share. To be an operating system vendor, you might completely ignore that for the first 20 years of your existence, or first 25 years of your existence, and still have the bulk of the revenue available in the market. So you're here, you want to build high performance machines, you can't rely on proprietary operating system vendor who isn't focused on this market, who's focused on a broader market. Open source software let us Take an operating system, the same one you use at your desktop, and extend it into the high performance computing world. Commodity clustering wouldn't have happened like this without an open source operating system like this. And Linux still dominates it because we can build tools that are more effective for this environment. It's a niche environment, but we have a lot of people who are dedicated towards making it work and can feed those tools back in. There's another aspect, and that is what about all those? the source code and look inside and say, yeah, this will work in a cluster environment. And when it doesn't work, we have the ability to go in and fix it and publish those changes and say, yeah, here, here's the silly thing they did that kept it from working in a cluster environment. Uh, here's a fix that will apply to everybody and make this useful tool work for this 5% of the users who want to build features. So open source really makes commodity clustering the name services, which is a really fun area, but probably uh, too much technical content. A little bit about our philosophy.
to you about file systems, and that's basically, yeah, you can mount file systems to support the application. You have an execution model that doesn't require mounting network file systems. It helps you mount local file systems. Skipped all, all physical management because, well, that's necessary, but there are lots of tools that already do that. Most physical management isn't tied into your cluster management at all. People just call them cluster management. By physical management, by the way, I'm talking about monitoring temperature and airflow and voltages and such. Those are important for lar running large compute rooms, but they're not important for creating a single, easily managed, single system image, easily administered cluster. They're important for knowing which piece of hardware to replace or which one's about to fail or has failed, but that's different from the software management. Uh, finally, and I've got to leave time for Josh here, uh, workload virtualization. So what we've done, we've created the cluster, we've rooted a whole bunch of compute nodes, we've created the minimal environment there, something where we can run applications. Um, so we've made this nice interactive, you can use, spread a job over hundreds of machines. How do you actually manage those hundreds of machines? How do you fire off jobs and make sure they land on the right machines? How do you work with other people who want to use that set of machines? Uh, they need 100 machines to run their application, and you need 100 machines, and you only have 112. Um, how do you handle all of that? And that's the layer you have to build on top of that, a, a workload virtualization layer. Workload virtualization is a different way of saying sketch first. So, uh, Josh, you are... Sure. Should I give you a different warm-up for that? Yeah, you should, but that's all right. Uh, do you want to take a break for Kumas first, or...? Sure, why don't we do the, the raffle in the book? Okay. Jabber, you get your tickets? We're going to do one book. Jabber's Then we're not going to do a raffle on tickets. Anyway, he stole the book. Anybody really want this book? What <laughs> 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 is it? <laughs> John, do you have a slide of like your software name where it's available for download and what it's documented with there? Josh, is, Josh is, has got that handled. That's the. Uh, you have to wait a little bit for this sort of uh, ice thing. This look true? Is it new book or is it new? It's a new book. I'm just looking for uh, the copyright. Make sure that you get the slide. Just open off this presentation. First printing, June 2008. That's a great idea. Okay. It's even got a CD-ROM. <laughs> 2008 should be a DVD. Anybody object to that? Anybody who's going to the brewery? The brewery has a party at 50 and they said they're very busy. Hey, Jerry, ask that the other way around. How many people are going to go to the sunset if we choose that? How many people? <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is not the sunset nine, ten, in uh, 11. Brighton. So where is this one? Oh, the sunset? There, sunset there, there's Grill. a well-known sunset that's in Brighton, but obviously you're not thinking of that one. No, so. the Sunset Grill is in um, Cambridge. It's in Cambridge Street. Cambridge Street and Fulkerton. Yeah. Okay. Really it's easy to get to. It's about the same distance as the... Uh, yeah, much, much further along, Jerry. It's, 
I would probably not say it's in walking distance. Oh, that's a little bit though. further. It's, uh, you have to go up to essentially um, Cardinal Maderos and take a right. And you go all the way down there to Cambridge Street and I believe you take a left. And it's on the right up for a couple of blocks. A little bit too far to walk. We could chance it at Cambridge Brewery. So who wants to? <coughs> Let me take a vote here. How many people would prefer going to Cambridge Brewery and take our chances? OK, how many people would rather go to the Sunset Grill? was pro Sunset Grill. It's Sunset Grill is 851 Cambridge Street. 851 Cambridge Street, set your GPS. And I was planning to walk to the brewery in such a beautiful night. Okay, Josh. So, um, Don talked a lot about uh, how we we do these things with our cluster management product right now. I want to ask a few questions first. How many people are managing clusters right now? How many people are managing clusters over 64 nodes? How many people are looking to buy clusters in the next six months? Or so? Okay, you guys. All right. So Don talked at a, at a high level about sort of how our, what our theories are, what our models are. Um, I came out today, I'm the senior software engineer for Skilled Clusterware, which is the official name of our product. Um, I have cards to hand out to everybody here who, if they'd like to download our product and try it for a little while. So I thought it'd be a little bit uh, interesting to sort of see a live demo rather than looking at a little bit of slides. Um, I've logged into my development cluster, and we're using a tool right now called Deus Deus. This is sort of a cluster top, if you will. You get some fundamental information about the nodes, what their statuses are, um, how much memory they're using, and so on and so forth. We're uh, science geeks, so we start our numbering at zero, with node negative one being the head node or the master node. So we sort of get a cluster at a glance. Now the interesting thing about this tool, as Don talked, or perhaps alluded to, is how we sort of keep uh, monitoring. How do we keep these statistics? Well, our architecture is such that the nodes have to boot up, and they have to sort of tell the master, occasionally, I'm still alive, I'm still here. But instead of replying with like a yes or a no, we simply ask the nodes to reply with their status information. So this status information gets stored in a shared memory region on a master node. And so anybody can run this tool, and instead of every time this updates, this is actually updating every five seconds, and since um, I'm on the road, I'm not actually doing any work, everything's idle. But the idea here is, uh, the idea here is that I can refresh this tool as quickly as I like. How many people run Ganglia, for example? Right? So if I had this refreshing over and over and over again, or if I had Ganglia up, and I had some user in Ganglia clicking refresh constant, all I'm doing is spamming XML packets over the network and asking the nodes to reply with this data. Well, what we've done is we've collected this data sort of as a function of our architecture. And anytime we look for an update, we just ask the shared memory region on a master. So for instance, the version of Ganglia that comes with our product when somebody clicks get fresh data in Ganglia, instead of spamming the network with XML data, Ganglia just asks the shared memory region. And then any tool actually can access, is free to use this information stored there. So what we've done is we've written a library, we provide an API, so you're even able to write your own management or monitoring tools. Um, we went ahead and this, this tool is actually implemented in Python, and there's actually a graphical version of this tool as well. So this is sort of one of the ways that we, we feel like we've been a little bit more efficient in the man or monitoring stage of dealing with the cluster. Questions here? Okay. One of the things that I don't think Don talked about was um, our unified process space. The unified process space is essentially the idea that when I run PS on a head node, I want to be able to see all the processes running across the whole cluster, not just the processes running on the node that I'm logged into. The idea of the product is to, and as Don talked about, is to manage the cluster as a workstation, not necessarily as a collection of computers. So if we look at my PS output here, we see some interesting things. We see processes that appear in brackets. Now, for at a lower level, a process that appears in brackets in Linux would normally be a zombie process. 
but technically a zombie process is one that has an entry in the process table, but no resident memory pages. And so if we understand that little idiosyncrasy, we say, aha, maybe those processes are running on remote nodes. And so if I run PS again, whoops, and not fat finger something, I can pipe the output of PS into one of our commands, and I see that now the output uh, of PS is prefixed with the node number that those processes are running on. So I can manage all the processes across the whole cluster as if they were running locally. A better example of this is shown when, uh, when we actually want to run something. We talked about using our shell. And we talked about this concept of process migration versus remote execution. The idea with RSH where we simply ask the node to execute something that may exist there versus migrating a process out there. In other words, giving a node an object or a package to run on the node. So our version of RSH is called BPSH. And we simply give it a node number, not a host name in this case. And um, my favorite silly example is just sleep. So what we basically said is run sleep, for lack of a better example, on node 0. And I get a process turn return. And again, if I run PS again, I see that uh, right here, we can see sleep is running on that node. And actually, sleep still appears in brackets. right? So we know that it's actually running out there. People don't believe me again. We can pipe to BP stat again. And we see that a little zero appears on the, the sleep line. So what happened in this case is we actually took the sleep binary. We looked at all the libraries that it's linked against. You can think of this at a high level as, a, as an LDD or a blind LDD. And we pack it, make, package that up into a little object and hand it to the node. And we say, here's your binary. Here are all the libraries you're running. On. And we get out to the node, and the node says, huh. I'm missing this particular library. So we ship that library out there. And as soon as the node realizes it has all the libraries it needs, it just continues running the program. And so we're actually running sleep on the compute node. Now, one of the things we need to do when we preserve this unified process space is preserve all the Linux semantics that go along with it. So things like signal delivery. I can attach a debugger to sleep, for example. I could simply S-trace it by just giving it a pick. Um, unfortunately, S-tracing sleep is sort of a bad example, but perhaps the better example would be killing the process. Instead of running kill on that node, or even knowing that kill is running on a remote node, I can simply <coughs> say kill, and then the PID, which is 19482, and I'll show the static process just to be happy. And this is all done through C library wrappers, and how are you doing that? This is done through uh, kernel hooks, okay. um, where we say, you know, the, the kill binary, the PS binary, those aren't things that we've hacked. They're not special versions. They're the same versions that ship with the distribution. But when that signal enters the kernel, we have code in there that says, um, oh, this PID is actually out running on a remote node. Let me store and forward the signal to the remote node. Okay. The beautiful thing about this is if you have a cluster with runaway processes, for example, or if you have a user that forgets that he ran his job last week on node 5, he can just run PS. And ultimately, he feels like, or the user or she feels like, the, the job is running on a local workstation. And as it turns out, there's a whole slew of nodes behind them running their code. Now, I want to repeat what Josh said and tell you why it's really cool. If you did this with our shell and you killed the process with our shell, you would kill the local endpoint. You would not kill the remote process. Here, we're actually killing the remote process, sending it a signal line that otherwise we couldn't send out. Worse, if we did that the traditional way with our shell and you killed the remote process, there's a pretty good chance the remote process, as soon as it tried to do I.O., would take 100% of the CPU and just hang there, using up all the CPU. Now, how, how do you handle the unified process ID space? It's like that kernel module. Okay. It's, yeah. It's, I like to say that it's, it's straightforward. Okay. Where does that live? upstream as far as I know. Right? No. 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 We've tried to get it upstream. Uh, different people think they have better ideas. Because you'd be the third user of LSM. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so just a little hint of how this works. When you push a job out to a remote machine, it reports back 
the one thing that it does different is when it tries to, when it goes out to fork, it goes back to the master and says, I'm trying to fork, may I, and if I may, what is my child's pick? So the master always keeps track of the process here. Always, and it tells you whether or not you can fork and creates that new pro process ID for you. Have you run this on a large enough buffer that you don't need to, like you used to all the time? Uh, that used to be a big problem way back in the two, two kernel days. Uh, today the kernel can support a large number of process IDs. It's, so it's four billion, I think. It's two to the 30 or something obscene. And it's dynamic, it dynamically scales anyway. Eight billion? I'm sorry? It dynamically scales in two six. Exactly. Anyway. So yeah. it doesn't matter, right? right. It's like whatever. Right. Now your real your real issue is what how big you can go before the human gets overwhelmed. Not how well the kernel can support. The kernel is really efficient at supporting 30, 50,000 kids. You can test that out in your local machine and things work just fine. They didn't used to, by the way. Now, do you extend this? Obviously, you have okay. You have remote signal delivery. What other uh, unit extractions have you done with this? I mean, do you, the standard do you share I/O memory is another good example, right. right? Standard I/O is also preserved. Um, that's done through when the remote process starts up. We set up sockets between the remote node and the user's controlling terminal, and yep. then standard I/O is just redirected to the user. So it's a good segue. Um, the next example would be like a, uh, an MPI program, right? I, as a user, I want to run an MPI program. And, and most of the time, we either you know, have to submit a job through a scheduler, or uh, say, for example, we have to come up with a list of nodes that I'm allowed to run on. Well, at a fundamental level, the user doesn't really need to know or really have to understand how, how to figure out what nodes to run on. So we have a, a mapping facility we call Baomap, which basically allows the user to specify an MP value, like MP8, and say some things like, I don't want to use the head node in the calculation for whatever reason. And what we get back is an integer list of processes that the system has determined the user is allowed to run now. Um, at a higher level, it basically says, it gives you, you know, nodes your first. It prefers packing on multi-core systems. Um, but it also keeps track of load. If node zero was loaded, then I don't want the next user to run on that node. So at a fundamental level, we have a, we have a, uh, a basic I don't want to call it a scheduler, but we have a basic mapping system. Um, we have an add-on product to Skilled called Taskmaster, which implements full schedule. But um, the idea here is that you can abstract this into your own programs. So if I wanted to NPI run a program, I don't have to actually give it a host list. I just say NP4. And we figure out, okay, I need four processes on whatever nodes, because at some point the user doesn't necessarily care. You, you do care sometimes about obviously having the same process certain set of processes always bound to one node. I mean, if you're trying, if you are trying to do, you know, some kind of threaded application right. or inter-process communication right. using shared memory, for example. Right. right. Well, the user can control this. At a, this is all at a very fundamental level. Obviously, um, things get more interesting when you can introduce a schedule, which is what Don set me up to talk about, but I decided that this was probably more interesting. People agree? Yeah? No? Blank stairs? <laughs> Um, maybe I should touch on schedulers real quickly. But this is just sort of at the, the basic use level, okay. sort of carrying the paradigm over to that. I'm interacting with the cluster as it were just a workstation rather than a set of nodes. Even though when you have a lot of users running on there, you're running a more sophisticated application, you need to have that fine grain, that finer grain. So does this map the kernel see all the nodes that you can't properly No. So we're, we've unified the process space, but we haven't unified the memory space. Um, but I can do things like, you know, I mean, we can tap proc CPU on a node if you'd like. Um, especially, if you see anything interesting, it's because this hardware technically isn't released yet. So if you see weird symbols. Um, but I can cat, you know, I can basically run any command I'd like on a remote node, right? The nice thing about this is if I I'm running a large CPU bound job on a bunch of nodes and I run top on the head node, right? The semantics are preserved, so it appears as though those processes are running on the head node. So it makes managing the system really, really easy. Josh, show what cat, uh, LS proc looks like on a slave node. That might not work. Oh, I didn't break it yesterday night. Uh, just do a regular LS with it. You can see the processes. 
sort of understands that they're existing out there. So it's, we're preserving all of the Linux semantics or all the Unix semantics that you would expect. Things like, um, you know, I.O. redirection, standard I.O. works very similarly. Um, signal delivery, things like P-trace, debugging. Um, just like the process was running on the master. It's really designed to be, you know, use the cluster as a workstation. So, so you would do the same thing, ls slash proc on the master, so they can see that it's slave node knows about it, the processes it's running, but the master knows about the processes everybody is running. It knows all of them. I'm sorry? On node zero. Right. The lowest number of process ID is just the internet. It is the internet. But there's some magic going on here that you don't necessarily see. So Don talked about this pivot root, if you will. So init's running outside of this pivot root, or had run outside of this pivot root, and we've actually substituted our own version of init into the pivoted root, or the target root, in order to preserve the semantics. Well, let me it's talk about the different terms. Think of this as a container. The, uh, on the slave node, we're running a separate sub-environment on behalf of that master, and init exists outside of that sub-environment. Here's where we're actually doing a little virtualization. So uh, I would illustrate that if you'd like. So you're not seeing a net there. Because a net was run in our initial RAM disk. It right. wasn't run on behalf of the master. So this is, I basically, I on my development machine, I can sort of get outside of that container if I'd like. So when I run PS on the node now, I actually see all the kernel threads. I actually see a net. And I see all the things that are running outside of that container. So there's some magic there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I was just curious. I mean, you don't you don't have any thread migrate uh, process migration running there, do you? Between nodes? Yeah. You can actually migrate a process between nodes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's not like an open mosaic style where the system is attempting to automatically rebalance the cluster. Right, right. Um, you you but can manually move as long you as it's compatible could. node with the same hardware. Absolutely. In fact, uh, <coughs> when I was at NASA, we did a uh, we had a big climate modeling code for uh, Jupiter actually, and the code ran for like a month. And unfortunately for the for the sysadmin team like myself, we had to take the cluster down periodically for various reasons. Yeah. So we couldn't we couldn't you know ask the code to just stop running for a little while while we turned off the machines. So we wrote a little signal handler into the application that would look at its available memory or look at another node. And that when it received a particular signal, it sort of cleaned up. It called our BPROC API to move to a different machine. And that way we could shut, shut down the nodes that it was actually running on really easily. And that was just pick up and move. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, when you move the process or you migrate a process, the complexity is, well, what do you do with your open file descriptor? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, well, we just close that. And we hope that the application reestablishes itself, which is why you have to write your own signal. Right? right? That's, that's, uh, I, I think that's the intelligent way to do checkpoint restart. A lot of people ask about, um, what well, can you do checkpoint restart by just moving processes around? And the real answer is the application has to be open. Mm -hmm. There's really no fail-safe way that I've seen that works for in every case where you can checkpoint migrate an application without the application knowing about it. It just can't happen. Basically, it's the way Yes, and well, before we designed this system, actually back at NASA, on some of our clusters, we ran Condor, the early versions of Condor, and we looked at Mosix, and Mosix, Mosix, uh, <coughs> and both of those systems have significant flaws. One is that they don't help you set up a cluster. Mosix, in particular, has the flaw of cascading failure, where if one machine goes down, it cascades to bring down all of the rest of the nodes in the cluster. This model avoids any cascade <coughs> failure. If a compute node goes down, it's just like the process processes on there died with an unrecoverable unknown memory fault. And in fact, it's reported in the standard Unix way as a memory fault, as uh, the reason for the, the process exit. I mean, the same with uh, Condor does IO checkpointing through the library and linker magic. 
that's a bad, bad way to do it. It doesn't work with all applications. <coughs> and then the other question is like, you know, how do you run an MPI application and then check something? Right? Condor can't. Um, if, the if the MPI application knows that it's check being checkpointed, then something like Condor might work a little bit better. But the idea is that the system and the application have to work together so that the semantics are preserved. You can't just you know, the application can't just necessarily do it by itself, and the, the sort of underlying management tool can't just blindly checkpoint the application. The two have to work together. So one of the things we wanted to do was all of the, the libraries and the C API, the user space utilities, we have our, our API published for. And you can look at it and say, oh, I can sort of make this library call and allow my application to checkpoint. Or I can request that my application <coughs> Let's say, for example, um, your application's turning along and all of a sudden you realize that you're running out of memory. Well, maybe you want to look at all the other nodes in the cluster to see if you can find a node with more memory that you may move to. <coughs> right? That's a good example of, of, sort of, of sort of where the API can be applicable. Um, I want to talk about scheduling real quickly um, and, and workflow at a higher level. I don't have any slides, so I apologize that you'll just have to look at text on the screen for a little while. But that's our job. That's your job, yeah. Um, <laughs> Once we've sort of developed this, this very flexible uh, solution, this sort of base, right, the real complexity becomes in, well, how do you get real users running on the system? We looked at one model where you have a small number of users, maybe they're running it in an interactive case, but ultimately we need a scheduler. And the idea of a good scheduler should be to allow you to apply, teach the cluster about your business or about your workflow. The idea is fire and forget, right? Things like Torque or SGE are generally uh, first in, first out schedule. You can do some things like prioritization, um, minimally in Torque with routing. You can add credits and things like SGE. But the idea here is we really wanted to come up with a scheduler that allowed you to say things like, this job is more important than this job uh, every other day of the week unless there's been a blue moon. The idea is to also provide feedback to the user and provide feedback to the administrator that I've set this policy and the cluster is actually delivering what I expected. A lot of the open source schedulers like uh, like Torque and SGE, or even things like LSF or PBS Pro, the commercial ones, um, they don't provide that sort of guarantee, that feedback loop. And so what we wanted to do was develop a method or a mechanism where we can take all this text and take all this usage numbers and make it a little bit more um, presentable for maybe not even people that can type at a command line. I mean, I, I know this sounds silly, but I've actually had my mother submit jobs through a web interface. It's a lot easier to point and click than it is to type. Let's see, did you break Firefox on your laptop, Dom? My uh, laptop's just a, just a little slow. Okay. Go ahead and start a new session. You don't want yes. anything else popping up from the last time. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, not, not like those websites you visit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll never let you catch me doing that again. <laughs> oh, God. Websites he's been viewing. Look at that. So this is our what we call our taskmaster product. This is an access portal. The idea here is a user can log into this access portal and um, have a graphical view of the cluster. Point and click. We want to point and click for job deletion. We want to point and click for job cancellation. And I know a lot of you are laughing, like, well, I don't need a GUI. I I really can type. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can probably guess what it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you what. There's a prize for anybody that leaves me a message on this cluster. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm serious. That would be a fun game, wouldn't it? <laughs> so let's see. So some of the more interesting things are this node view, where we can take a look at the nodes. And unfortunately, I don't have anything running on the nodes. But we want to be able to sort of represent, as a user, what nodes are my jobs running on. So if my user, my, my ATS user had jobs on here, we would have color codes on the nodes that would be lit up that says, okay, this job is running on this node. The idea here is for the user to sort of gain a little bit of confidence or a naive user to build a little bit of confidence. Um, but also for the administrator to say, okay, I know Josh is kind of cranky when I you know, bring the cluster down and his jobs are running. So what nodes can I turn off to upgrade the memory on or fix the hard drive on or expand the hard drive on? in order to you know, make Josh happy. Don, for example, hates it when I kill his compiles. Right? So I, when I want to go upgrade the cluster, add some new hardware in there, 
I don't want to do it to nodes that his jobs are running on. So what I want to do is provide a real, a real easy visual tool, a sort of representation of the abstract, right? We've abstracted the cluster away, and now we want it to present it back to the user in a way that, that's easy to understand. Um, the goal here, and I, we actually have customers doing this sort of thing where, um, in the, I was just in New York, in the finance market, a lot of guys are just running um, big Excel calculations, right? These are traders, these are business people. They don't, they don't know SSH from Telnet. But they do know that if they click a little button in their Excel sheet that says remote solve, something magical happens. And their, their spreadsheet gets solved in you know, 10 minutes versus the 10 hours it used to on their workstation. So we wanted to provide a mechanism for them to log in and sort of see what the status of this was. Give them a little bit of insight. Questions about this? No? You guys want to see me type again? You should. You should try. Alright. We talked about, uh, or I talked about reporting a little bit. And this is the idea that as an administrator, you want to be able to tell a user, you're allowed, um, you know, 80% or 30% usage. This is this fair share concept. And you don't want the user knocking down your door and emailing you every 10 minutes saying, how do I know I'm getting what you told me? How do I know what I'm getting what you told me? Right? You're laughing because you know how this, you know how this happens, right? I promised you 30%, I think I'm only getting 27 and a half. Right? So we wanted to provide a mechanism for users to sort of find out, well, what does is, what is my utilization actually look like? Right? Um, this, again, you have to use your imagination a little bit because I didn't bake this as well as I perhaps could have. Um, another graph, and another interesting uh, uh, chart is this estimated start time. This is the idea that, okay, for the green line is the, the wall clock limit of a job. So for a job of 16 hours, what is my estimated time in the queue for, say, four processors or 16 processors? Right? Obviously, for on a 16 processor cluster, you're going to wait forever for 64 processors. So that's why we see infinity there. But with load on this machine, users can come in and say, hmm, if I submit this job in a 16, 16 processor configuration, I'm going to wait this long. Or if I submit it in a four processor configuration, I'm going to wait this long. So the idea is to provide feedback, right? The cluster should provide users more information than just the output of their code, but also allow them to increase the efficiency of their workflow. The social engineering issue with that, because if you're working with traders in New York, I can't imagine any of them saying, oh, I'll take it in four hours instead of I want it right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, you know, what you'll find is um, a lot of, uh, let's go back to that. A lot of people say, you know, my, my code runs in four, I can run it in four processors, or I can run it in 16 processors. A lot of uh, fluid dynamic simulations scale nicely and can run in any sort of configuration. So for those types of applications, we want people to have that sort of information. On Wall Street, things are a little bit different, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily wait for a simulation to come back, right, or a trading deadline to come back. A lot of it is done in real time. But, so the metaphor doesn't carry over to that much. But the goal, again, is to design the product and design the feedback to fit any model, right? We don't want to be just specific to one market. You know, I tell guys like that, that uh, if you can convince your boss to spend the extra $500 million to upgrade the system, then sure, you can have it. And you'd be surprised on Wall Street, they spend money like water. Right, Dave? Yep. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Anything anybody else wants to talk about? Um, I want to make sure everybody gets a little card here. This card contains a little URL where you can download a full version of our product. It's uh, time locked at 30 days, but since you guys were all nice to me, if you email me, um, I can extend it for as long as you like. Okay, but on increments, because you know, some people don't like me just giving away our software. Although I would if it were up to you. Question.
you mount the file systems to support the applications, not to support the underlying systems. So we allow you in that change root environment, per, there's a spe separate change root environment per master. Uh, you can mount whatever file that you like. Local, or by default it's a RAM disk, or you can NFS mount even a full installed root if you wish, if you want to make it look like a traditional cluster environment. Yeah, so the, uh, the neat thing about this, the mount system, FS camp file exists on the master machine. The master tells the compute node as at the end of the boot up process, it configures it for the hardware, it says, ah, before you run an application, mount these file systems, and it reads the FS tab file on the master, says mount this, mount that, mount that. So here's the FS tab file on the master. Uh, and just to show you the command he ran to, that was, um, we're in Etsy Beowulf, so all the files that are in, uh, would normally be in Etsy for the local <coughs> machine or in Etsy Beowulf for the cluster. So this is the list of all the files you want to mount in slave mode. Slave modes that aren't up, you don't have any slave nodes attached, you can still edit this file to have them mount additional file systems. The advantage of that is nodes you haven't yet seen get, haven't yet plugged into the cluster role and after they boot up, automatically mount these file systems to support the application. And uh, typically you want to add a pass mount slash uh, home you want to run shell scripts, you probably want bin and user bin. Now you can still run executables out there, but you might not be able to run a shell script completely properly unless you NFS map. We still use the caching subsystem underneath, but they still run efficiently. And that's not that non-fatal. Yeah, non-fatal means that, oh well, if you couldn't mount it, you still want to be able to complete the boot process because you want to be able to do diagnostics on that node. Fatal would mean or leaving off the non-fatal keyword there, which means if you can't mount that file system, the node is still up, the administrator can still put the process out there and see what's going on, but it's not made marked available for regular end user processes. So again, philosophy, you don't mount anything <coughs> for the underlying system, you mount the file system to support the application. And applications might need a lot of file systems, but if anything is broken, you can fix it in one place true diskless compute nodes, but diskless administrative might mean you're still mounting file systems. The opposite approach is requiring a local disk for any operation, and then you don't have the opportunity to do those things. So all the cluster distributions that start out with the model of a full install, they can't go to diskless. They can do NFS root, but NFS root is a, a administrative problem that grows with of course, you might want different nodes to mount different file systems. We can specialize everything so that node 23 uses fscan.23, and all the ones that aren't listed get their own file to go back to the default. So we can specialize this. By default, um, when it comes out of the box, you don't mount anything but slash home, uh, your, your diskless operation. shows our config file philosophy. Everything is done in text, human readable text. Programs parse this. If it updates it, it keeps the comments in place. Um, this is basically all the information you need to run the cluster. A lot of people would put that information in their database. We keep it in a simple text file because really what do you need to know? You need to know the cluster is on network interface E1. That's where you talk to the compute nodes. We can forward traffic. We're allowing four nodes in this IP address range. That's basically all you need to know to configure to set up a cluster. Any, yeah, comments, so any comments on networking uh, as far as physical requirements for the network or recommendations? Which got oh, pretty that's a really good question. We defined our system to work in an era of Second, 
network, if we had 500 nodes updating once per second, and for the processing to once per second for the statistics, how many things would this regress? So the un with 100 megabit a second unswitched repeater based network, we could support hundreds of nodes. With a 100 megabit a second that fast Ethernet switch network, we could support about a thousand nodes. With gigabit, Now, interesting thing with networks, today, gigabit Ethernet, switch gigabit Ethernet is the standard, really, really inexpensive thing. Uh, you can support thousands of nodes with that, unless the application is demand. Now, recently, InfiniBand has become surprisingly inexpensive. In the past, there was always 90% of the users that used Ethernet, and then 10% of the users, cluster users that ran applications that needed a special network like Miranet, guarantees you about one microsecond latency as well. Yeah, it's uh, amazingly low. It's not that fast. Well, well the theoretical specs are one microsecond. Well, you'll see the you some of the adapters the are one microsecond. Right. But, but yeah. in reality, with a reasonable packet size, you're going to see five to, I'd, I'd say five to ten microseconds, yeah. Yeah. realistically. But it's still an order of magnitude faster than Ethernet would, would be, you know, in the 50 to 60 microseconds. The point is it's comparable with MiriNet. It's, it's exactly comparable with MiriNet, and, and it's about a third of the cost. Yeah. Yeah. Because Miranet lies just as much as the kind of advantage lies. Yes. Yes. I'd like so to jump in here and say this. We, we, we should probably continue this after the cafe because it's getting very late. Okay. And uh, just one quick question for everyone. Uh, is that is that going to be? Uh, if I unplug this right now, is it going to screw anyone up here? Who, who's connected to the uh, the wire? The what do they call this? The blue install space wireless. That's the end. Nobody. <laughs> Great. Okay, I just want to show a hand. So who's going to the Sunset Grill? Cafe. Sunset Cafe. Okay, on Cambridge Street. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. John's going. Josh. And if you guys want demo cards, come see me and Don. Yes, that's all the information you need. That's what I'm going to use anyway. Are you coming with me? Yep. Okay. So, if you know, you know where the train caps I haven't driven here. I finally made it down to Cambridge. Yeah. Especially, you know, when Don gets to... Yeah. When Don gets to... Your car died, but I still managed to get How did you do that? <laughs> yeah. you, oh. I was about to ask if you walk the rest of the way. No, the car died this morning. Oh. Yeah, we're right downtown. I guess it could have been worse.